Hello once again and welcome to another slide video from the Cornish Radio Amateur Club and today we're going to look at EMC, electromagnetic compatibility. And this um, takes up eight questions from the uh, exam you're going to take. So um, it's a subject worth having a good look at. Um, I would thoroughly recommend you have a look at both the syllabus to see what you need to learn and also the uh, excellent book from uh, the RSGB, either advanced or full, depending on uh, which um, uh, date you're taking the license. Uh, full being the later one, which takes into account the syllabus changes, uh, I think from August 1919. Anyway, let's have a look at the syllabus. This is the old syllabus. 7a says routes of entry into TV and radio. 7A1 says, understand that amateur transmissions can be picked up by the intermediate frequency stages of TV and radio receivers and identify related amateur transmissions. Understand that television receivers and most broadcast radio receivers employ superheterodyne circuits and recall some typical frequencies used in radio and television receivers, i.e. 470 to 854 MHz, TVRF, and 3.3, that's 33, to 40 megahertz TV IF. Video baseband would be 0 to 5 megahertz, and radio IFs are typically 455 or 500 kilohertz, and 10, and I should say 10.7 megahertz. So, <clears throat> this is routes of entry, um, and they're saying that uh, in the early stages, obviously, that um, the signals can go into the IF, uh, if you are um, emitting a signal uh, around, say, 10 megahertz, and you're close to a domestic uh, receiver, then um, the filtering of the IF stages um, is unlikely to reject your signal very much if it's a 10.7 megahertz IF. Um, <clears throat> and it lists out some um, RF frequencies and um, IF frequencies. Now, one of the reasons for the syllabus change, I suspect, is that um, the complete digitization of the UK uh, for DVB um, television means that some of the information and some of the questions will be um, a little bit out of date in as much as nobody's using analog TVs anymore. Um, understand the potential for second channel, which is image frequency interference. Well, uh, have a look at the um, receivers A, B, C and D and the chapter on receivers uh, to make sure you understand exactly what an image is and recall that it's twice the IF away from the wanted signal. So um, if uh, you happen to be transmitting on a um, an image channel for a domestic FM receiver or indeed an old television with a um, near an old television that has a set-top box, um, then that may cause a problem. 7A2 says, recall that amateur transmissions can enter the RF stages and cause cross-modulation and or blocking. Recall that cross-modulation occurs when strong varying signals, e.g. AM, SSB or CW signals, impress its own modulation on the wanted signal. Recall that blocking, also known as desensitization, occurs when strong constant transmissions, e.g. FM signals, cause radio or television to be overloaded. So these are two effects, cross-modulation and blocking, which we'll be looking at um, in subsequent slides. So the routes of entry into TV and radio, slide two. So 7A3 says, understand that masthead amplifiers are frequently wideband devices and can suffer from cross-modulation and overload, causing intermodulation and blocking, and may also overload the TV. Now, masthead amplifiers have been around for a long time and are typically um, very wideband with poor filtering, particularly if they're a bit old. Um, so uh, these have been the cause of many... Uh, radio frequency interference problems, uh, and so get special highlighting in the syllabus. Recall that amateur transmissions can enter audio stages via long speaker leads or other interconnections. Well, this is one of the mechanisms of pickup that we'll be looking at in subsequent slides. 
Understand that NEPN junction with an electronic device can rectify unwanted RF. So they're saying you don't need to explicitly have a detector to be able to rectify some of the envelope waveforms, um, but um, just a, a, um, a diode. So the diode, for example, could be in the power supply um, and could end up unwittingly or um, unintentionally uh, acting as a detector and perhaps uh, impressing um, the uh, detected waveform on the power supply rails or something like that. So any PN junction within, the, within an electronic device can rectify unwanted RF. Now remember that um, transistors are PNP or NPN, so it doesn't even have to be a diode of a PN junction. It could be, um, it doesn't have to be a PN junction on its own. It could be a PN junction within, for example, a transistor or indeed a logic gate or anything like that. Recall that passive intermodulation products can be produced by corroded contacts in any metalwork, including transmitting and receiving antennas, supports and guttering. This is a so-called rusty nail effect, where if you get some oxide against a pure metal, it acts as a diode, and therefore um, it can um, uh, cause problems you know, mixing because it becomes, if you like, a non-linear device. So passive intermodulation products can be caused by corroded contacts in any metalwork, including transmitting and receiving antennas, supports, and guttering. So then we move on to filters. Understand the construction and use of a typical mains filter. So that's an understand one. There's quite a few of these are understand ones, so <clears throat> we'll cover that uh, later on. Understand, oh, I beg your pardon, identify a typical circuit of a braid breaking filter and a combination high pass and braid breaking filter. Understand their use. So you may be shown the circuit here and ask what it is, and you need to be able to identify it correctly and understand when you'd use it. Braid breaking may actually be the physical disruption of the braid of a coax, or it may be the electron, uh, e electrical disruption, if you like, uh, with filtering of the braid. So the um, uh, theory behind this is that we're trying to prevent common mode currents in the um, uh, braid of a coax causing problems. And if they're there, breaking the braid, if you like, breaks the circuit for these common mode currents. Identify why a ferrite ring will attenuate common mode currents without affecting the differential mode wanted signal. So we'll be looking at that as well. Recall the use of ferrite beads or rings in internal and external filtering. Understand the use of notch filters, including coaxial stubs as notch filters or traps in minimizing an unwanted signal. Understand the use of high, low and bandpass filters in improving the immunity of affected devices. And then we move on to field strength. Um, <clears throat> recall that reducing field strength to the minimum required for effective communication is good radio housekeeping. Recall and apply the formula for the field strength surrounding an antenna, giving the ERP a distance from it. So there's a formula there in the back of the um, uh, in in the sheet you're given in the exam, and it's um, it, it's uh, field strength in volts per meter, and we need to also be able to distinguish between um, power flux density, which is in watts per meter squared, and uh, field strength, which is in volts per meter, and um, there's a formula in the back in the um, uh, formula sheet that you're given. It says um, field strength in volts per meter is equal to uh, 7 root ERP over D, where D is the distance. And ERP is the linear gain with respect to the half-wave dipole. So you need to be able to uh, understand and use that formula, and we will be doing an example of that um, in the subsequent slides. Feeders and antennas. Recall that balanced antenna systems tend to cause fewer EMC problems than unbalanced antennas. And recall that feeder, balanced or unbalanced, should leave the antenna at right angles to minimize coupling. Mobile installations. Understand that EMC problems in motor vehicles can have serious safety implications and identify suitable precautions. And we'll be looking at a whole uh, section on, or a whole slide on 
um, EMC uh, for motor vehicles. So there are a number of points that you need to um, understand or, or commit to memory at least. Social issues. Recall the correct procedures for dealing with EMC complaints while understanding that although new electronic equipment should meet the EMC standards, some existing equipment may not. Right, um, returning to um, social issues there, um, that isn't really covered in um, this uh, uh, slide pack. Um, I've really tended to focus on the technical aspects here. Um, I think the main thing you need to do here is to read the section in um, advance, chapter 12, uh, EMC, um, to make sure that you understand what the proce procedures are. In terms of um, understanding why new electronic equipment should meet the EMC standards, um, uh, some of the old equipment um, does not. We'll be covering that in slides. So let's start now with um, the tuition part of the um, video. What is EMC? EMC is the avoidance of interference between two pieces of electronic equipment. The EMC directive is laid out in a bit more detail at intermediate level and if you've still got the book it's recommended you have a quick read through that. Amateur transmitters can cause an EM environment that is more severe than domestic equipment can be expected to handle. So the point of this bullet point is that uh, it's no good saying um, my equipment is um, you know, compatible, my transmitter, uh, the guy next door it's down to him, um, because guy next door, his uh, receiving equipment, be it a television or a radio or something similar, um, is only required to handle, if you like, reasonable field strengths. And by the very nature of amateur radio, we are probably transmitting unreasonable field strengths in as much as they may well exceed the EMC directive. And therefore, uh, it's not down to him to... Um, uh, fix the problem, it's down to you. So EMC directive, two principles. There's the emission standards, that's transmitting, and they set maximum limits of radio frequency interference that equipment, such as computers, for example, can generate. And the immunity standards, which have been there since 1996. So since 96, it also says that equipment that is sold, domestic um, and retail equipment, must meet certain immunity standards in as much as is, if there is a radio frequency interference around, they shouldn't have an adverse effect um, below a certain level. And, um, for example, the SEN55022 for computers um, is one of the standards, and there are other standards for other types of equipment. And... If a piece of equipment isn't um, uh, covered by a, spe a specific standard, for example, it's not a computer, it's not a piece of audio equipment, etc., perhaps it's some sort of new gizmo that's on the market, then there's a generic um, catch-all standard which applies. So the radio amateur must consider um, spurious transmitter outputs, and we've covered um, a lot of these in uh, the video and also uh, in the advanced book on um, transmitter interference. And transmitter interference and this EMC chapter go together sort of hand in hand. Um, so if you look at transmitter interference and um, this chapter together, it, it accounts for quite a few uh, questions in the, in the paper. So it's worth um, trying to get a, a deep understanding if you can. So... Uh, too much power causing excessive field strength at the affected device. As I said earlier, uh, if you're transmitting a, a high power level, even a modest power level, um, that may be much more, that may, may be causing a field strength far greater than the um, immunity standards um, are, are set at, so that um, receiving devices or other electronic devices may be affected uh, not because they are inadequately um, hardened against RFI, but because there is simply too much field strength caused by your transmitter in the general area. Um, the mode of operation, that is the type of um, modulation that you're using, uh, has a, a, an effect. 
um, with uh, the envelope waveforms being worse than the constant uh, waveforms. So the greater the depth of modulation on an envelope waveform, um, the worse it is. So as a general rule, FM is the best type of modulation, the least likely to cause interference. Um, then uh, AM, then SSB, a uh, big button, then, um, sorry, FM, CW, uh, uh, AM, um, and SSB being one of the worst. Um, and there are also subtleties in that as well, in as much as um, sending two data tones by SSB uh, may be less disruptive than um, sending a voice by SSB. So the antenna type and sighting, obviously that um, includes uh, proximity, uh, gain and direction. And the coupling mechanisms, and we'll be going through some of the, the coupling mechanisms in later slides. Filters, the amateur must consider the use of filters and um, uh, that sort of thing. The inadequate immunity of the affected device. If a device is before 1996, it's not required to have any immunity. So, for example, a hi fi um, that uh, is um, a pre 96 uh, may be more subject to picking up RFI than one that's post 96 and doesn't comply with the standards. Um, so, you may need to make uh, take special efforts, make special take special measures to uh, harden the uh, the affected hi-fi yourself, and other unrelated sources. So you must also consider that perhaps the um, uh, perhaps the inference is is taking place from uh, nothing to do with your transmission, but an unrelated source. So these are the this is a checklist of um, what you need to look at uh, when you are. And dealing with a radio frequency interference interference problems. So unintended radiation. Let's have a look. Um, to stop unintended radiation, which is, if you like, part of the spurious emissions um, checklist, uh, we need a good RF earth, and we mustn't use the mains earth. The reason is that we don't want to impose on the mains earth, which may be low resistance to ground, but may have a fairly high impedance. And we don't want to impose any RF signals because the mains will simply become a conduit then, the mains earth will become a conduit to carry the interfering signal from perhaps your shack um, to some uh, domestic device. Um, in the same vein, it's a good idea to have filters on main supplies to the shack. This means that um, you can... Uh, ensure that if you do generate any RF in the shack and it is superimposed back onto the mains um, that it won't travel back into the uh, general house wiring. There is a disadvantage to this approach of course in as much as you, if you're using internet over, over um, power uh, devices then they will be rendered useless because it will also filter out their signal. Um, some people would say that's a good thing because they tend to cause noise on, on receivers anyway. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the antennas, at HF balance antennas uh, that are compact and horizontal keep near fields to a minimum. If you recall from the lectures and um, from the book, the near field is where uh, we don't consider things in terms of a fully formed RF signal. Um, so, for example, we wouldn't be using um, the near field uh, distance from the um, uh, you know to, cal to calculate, for example, receive signal strength and stuff like that. Um, the near field in the near field, we consider that we just have, if you like, electric and um, magnetic coupling, much as we do a transformer. Uh, at several wavelengths away, we consider that the um, radio signal is formed into a proper EM signal uh, and we don't get just general electromagnetic direct coupling. <coughs> it's when we do get coupling in the near field between an antenna and a device um, that you know we get the greatest problems. So here we're saying that balanced antennas, uh, compact and horizontal, uh, keeps near fields to a minimum. Um, use good quality uh, connections. Um, that's coax with a good thick braid. You know, not all coaxes are equal. Um, 
quality characters, some of them in fact having a solid uh, outer uh, braid, um, like, a, like a tube, which can still be bent and still flexible, um, like the more expensive feeders from Andrews, um, of course is the best quality. Uh, and at the worst end I've seen is, is some of the um, uh, coax used for um, satellite TV, which can be very, very uh, sparse in, in terms of the braid. Uh, we should also uh, check regularly for uh, um, emissions and check for intermodulation between uh, two transmitters. Um, it'll be perhaps rare that you have two transmitters uh, yeah, actually keyed at the same time but uh, not impossible, um, and you should look to see if you've got any intermodulation products, in, a, in, a, in, a, in other words, any mixing happening between those two um, transmitters. So, now let's have a look and see, in practice, how that uh, turns out into being a good station layout. Okay, here we have the a diagram of a transmitter connected through to an antenna and we can go through the various components of this um, and see uh, what we need to prevent um, RFI. So a um, bandwidth filter on the microphone, which is just pulsed there, um, this will prevent any out-of-band signals caused by excessive bandwidth or excessively high frequencies being applied to the transmitter. Um, so the microphone uh, should either have a, a filter in line with it or in the transmitter, the early stages of the transmitter must have um, filters which, ref which restrict the bandwidth of the audio. Maybe remember, typically we have about 2.7 or 3 kilohertz of uh, audio bandwidth that we use uh, in radio amateur. The next thing is the uh, key click filter. Um, if you recall from the work you've done already on transmitter interference. We don't want too fast an attack time on the uh, um, first few cycles uh, of CW as the key goes down. We don't want the um, RF envelope to instantly establish. We want it to, if you like, go up a little bit gradually. And then when we release the uh, key, we want it to go down a little bit. You should have in mind for the exam um, a circuit diagram of a key click filter. If you, not, if you don't, have a quick look back at the uh, transmitters, uh, transmitter interference chapter. Um, we should filter the main, microphone and key leads. All leads interconnecting uh, items there should have some sort of filtering. And we'll be looking at a mains filter later, um, but microphone and key leads can be as simple as uh, winding them through a, an appropriate um, uh, ferrite ring or clipping ferrite beads to the outside. Do not over modulate or overdrive. Again, this refers to the transmitter interference chapter. Have a look at that and see what the consequences of overdriving or over modulating are. Uh, and also you need to be able to um, uh, decide if you are producing, for example, harmonics, then are they harmonics of the in audio going in or are they harmonics of the RF frequency. So have a look at that chapter again. Good quality kayaks and connections um, between the um, various items there. Um, recall that PL259, although they're called UHF plugs, they're not much good at UHF uh, and if you're working at some of the higher frequencies it, you may be better off using for example um, N-type or SMA connectors um, as they're likely to be less lossy um, and less likely to uh, cause problems. Uh, good quality coax, we've discussed it briefly, but again, you need to look quite carefully at the um, specification for coax to make sure that at the frequency you're operating it's not too lossy and it doesn't cause um, high VSWRs uh, or it doesn't adversely affect your VSWR too much. An SWR meter, of course, uh, particularly at HF, is essential to uh, be able to uh, indicate that the system is um, well set up and that um, the impedances are matched between the various um, parts of the uh, of the radio. Um, low pass filter for HF and a band pass filter for VHF. 
Again, have a look at transmitter interference. If you recall, the low-pass filter is often fitted to VHF to stop the VHF producing uh, harmonics um, in the uh, VHF and above a band. Um, and, but for a VHF, we tend to use a bandpass filter because of the possibility of producing subharmonics as well. Uh, an antenna tuning unit for HF, again, to make sure that uh, we don't have a high VSWR reflected back into the transmitter, which causes a problem. Um, uh, a good RF earth, so we shouldn't use the mains earth unless the antenna is truly balanced and the coax feeder is absolutely dead. And that means the braid of the uh, of the feeder is absolutely dead. And it says do not join a mains and RF earth. Um, and we'll be going through that a bit later on. Let's see what the mechanism is then. So if we do have a, an antenna, which is the sloping line there at the top, uh, we will get currents on N-fed antennas or poorly balanced feeder coming back into the transmitter and ATU. And they need to go somewhere. And they will split between the RF earth and the mains earth, um, all else being equal. And here's the mechanism for it, really. The dotted line showing the currents um, coming down. And um, the blue box is there saying that um, the mains has a certain impedance, Z mains, and the RF earth has a certain impedance, RF earth. And we want, what we want is the RF earth to have a lower impedance than the mains. In other words, a thick, uh, straight um, earth connection, as short as possible, going vertically down into a good uh, piece of copper in the ground, be it a rod, be it a plate. Um, and that will provide the lowest possible um, RF earth um, impedance. Remember, because we're looking at RF signals, we're talking about impedance here. So a plate will give you lower impedance than a rod because you will get capacitive coupling of the earth, of the plate rather, to the earth, um, uh, uh, rather than just resistive coupling, which you tend to get with a, with a rod. So uh, having some capacitive coupling there will reduce the impedance of the remember cluster at um, high uh, frequencies as low reactance. So that will help you to get the best possible earth having a plate or at least a number of rods. Um, so the RF earth, let's have a look at this. Um, if we use the mains earth, the disadvantage are that the RF may flow to other equipments and noise from the mains earth, maybe you've got some uh, domestic appliances which are switching uh, high currents on and off, such as um, thermostats for heaters, etc. And they are inducing noise on the mains earth, um, which are electrical spikes, which contain high frequency components. Um, and the mains earth may have a poor impedance for high frequency components, and therefore um, uh, it, it may come around into your shack and cause interference on your receiver. So we try not to use the mains earth for RF. Um, so you need a good RF earth, and here we're saying that you need to uh, have um, the RF earth where the feeders enter the shack. You need several earth rods. And the RF earth at the base of the antenna uh, connect to the shack via a thick wire or braid. So how can we isolate RF earth from mains earth? Well, <clears throat> here's an example of the so-called uh, Z-match, an antenna matching unit. Um, and it isolates the RF from the mains earth. Here you can see on the right-hand side a, an unbalanced antenna, such as a quarter wave uh, vertical. Uh, and it's um, connected to a, an RF transformer. And the other end of the winding is connected down to earth. So this allows the um, antenna to function properly because it um, it uh, relies on, if you like, the reflection of the vertical element being in the ground to give it its electrical characteristics. But on the other side of the transformer, uh, the, uh, both the top and the bottom of the winding are not connected to Earth. So we've lifted up or isolated the other side of the transformer to, um, 
from the uh, from the earth and there are a couple of capacitors in there for tuning purposes and we uh, then go across site on a coax cable so here we have a z match for an unbalanced antenna and this would be located at the bottom of the uh, vertical antenna out in the garden and uh, there would be a box at the bottom with that transformer and capacitors and then from there you would run the coax back into the shack um, and um, hopefully um, all the RF earthing that you need to happen has gone on uh, over there at the antenna and when you come back um, you don't have any um, you've isolated the RF earth from the mains earth um, and now shown on the screen at the bottom is a similar arrangement but for a balanced antenna, a Z-match for a balanced antenna. Uh, for a balanced antenna, we don't need one side to be earthed at the distant end. Um, we, uh, we just need to have a transformer there to provide the isolation. So, <clears throat> at any point, you may come across um, PME, Protective Multiple Earth, um, text, and here are some PME dangers. Um, suitable precautions must be taken when fitting any separate earth or exposed accessible outside wires. Um, so, although we're putting uh, earths in outside, etc., um, we mustn't make them uh, accessible. They must be enclosed in a box or uh, buried beneath the ground or something like that. Uh, and this talks back to the um, PME risk that if the uh, station earth or the RF earth and the mains earth become bonded and simultaneously a fault uh, occurs outside of your property, perhaps further up the street, where the um, earth uh, connections to the neutral connector are somehow lost, then in effect your earth, your RF earth, becomes the um, earth for the street for multiple houses and any fault conditions in those houses then would pass through your earth. Well, that would be bad enough, but if it, if it was also touched by somebody, then that would be uh, even worse. So what they're saying here is, no matter that you're putting in the wires, which um, normally when you touch them would have no, um, no voltage on them, because they're at earth potential, uh, you must um, make sure that they are um, not uh, exposed uh, uh, and easy to uh, to access by by other people. So let's have a look at uh, mains leads, power leads, and other connections. Well, mains and power, uh, RF energy can escape down power leads into mains wiring. So we, we've said that already that um, if we have a transmitter and we have um, RF currents coming back from an unbalanced antenna, bad SWR, back into the transmitter then it's got to go somewhere and it can go into the mains wiring. Um, and this can escape back into the mains and it can escape into the live, the neutral and the earth. It doesn't, we're not necessarily just talking about um, the uh, earth. It can be the live and the neutral as well. So we need to fit uh, filters to the mains and indeed to DC leads. If you have a separate power supply on your transceiver, um, and your transceiver is fed by 12 volts, then the route of escape would be from the uh, for the RF energy to go back down the DC wires into the um, uh, power supply and then through the power supply uh, and back down into the mains. So we need to fit filters to mains and DC leads. And you can have a, um, a look at um, uh, subsequent slides where uh, we discuss fitting ferrite um, uh, to... Um, domains and DC leads. Um, also, we should recall that a, a computer can also be an escape route for RF, either generated by the computer or connected equipment. It's very common these days for uh, people to use uh, a separate PC connected to the, um, uh, or laptop connected to the transceiver for um, control or logging purposes or a whole stack of stuff, data receiving and uh, data connections or using a sound card to um, receive um, the tones from the receiver to uh, encode and in the other direction, um, sorry, decode and in the other direction, encode signals. 
Um, and the RF, it can come back into the uh, transmitter or the transceiver rather, and then travel down the interconnection leads to the uh, computer or laptop and then off to the mains. So that can be an escape route. Um, in fact, the, the computer itself can generate um, RF. It's got a clock inside and that can also be problematic. Um, if it uh, generates RF, it can be noisy uh, for the receiver. So that's covered here. Sound card audio leads and data leads should be filtered. Coaxial cables. Um, oh, a bigger one. Computer's mains lead should be filtered, e.g. ferrite rings. Uh, on uh, coaxial cables, uh, good quality coax cables could, should be used. Cheaper types have insufficient braid cover and can radiate. Braid must make secure connection to plug or socket outer. And ideally, feeders should be buried. So if you've got, um, I think the, the, the top three points there are fairly self-evident. Um, feeders, if you can bury them across the garden, it's an additional um, protection against the, you know, if you do have common mode currents in the coax outer, if you've buried the feeder, then at least the uh, feeder won't be radiating, um, you know, uh, over the length that it's um, buried. So with all this in mind, you should undertake uh, regular tests. Okay, and the license requires that you do that you can conduct regular tests from time to time to ensure you do not cause undue interference. So those are the items there for the exam in bold regular tests, time to time, and undue interference. So that doesn't mean you don't cause any interference at all. I suppose by definition any transmitter is causing some level of uh, interference. There will be some sort of um, harmonic uh, radiation, as long as it's not undue, then that's okay. Um, in the book advanced by the RSGB, the advice is that when you take the tests, you do them in a regular um, regular um, manner, and you log the fact that you've done them. Now, I don't think this is a legal requirement, because it's not a requirement to keep a log unless directed to by Ofcom or the master of a vessel or similar. Um, but um, this is, I think, just um, common sense advice so that you've got proof, um, con uh, contemporaneous account of the fact that you have been doing some checks. So the next slide, we go back to, um, I think, the one on antennas. Uh, we're looking at spreading loss here for power and field strength and just recalling the fact that power flux density in watts per meter squared uh, spreads out in accordance with the inverse square law. So at double the distance, you'd get a quarter of the uh, power flux density. At three times the distance, you would get a ninth. That's three, three to nine. Uh, at four times the distance, you'd get a sixteenth of the power flux density. So if you measured the power flux, flux density at one kilometer from a transmitter and noted it, and then walked a further um, a kilometer, so you then okay, you were then two kilometers away. The power flux density at that point would be um, a quarter of of what it was at the um, at the transmitter. So this is because of the way that radiation spreads out, and we've talked about this at various times through the various courses in the intermediate course and the advanced course where well, we have this imaginary antenna at the center of a globe. Maybe it's a point of light, and it diffuses its light equally in all directions, or its RF energy equally in all, all directions. Then it illuminates the inside of the sphere with a certain power level. If we double the uh, radius of the sphere, then the uh, uh, illumination will drop by uh, it'll be only a quarter. So this is because the surface area over which that single source, remember it hasn't changed in power, it has to um, illuminate four times the surface area. And there's a formula uh, A equals four pi R squared for the surface area of a sphere. And you can see that the surface area is proportional to R squared. If we double the uh, radius, 
the surface area goes up by 4. So the field strength in volts per meter, notice it's not volts per meter squared, it's just volts per meter, is just inversely proportional to the distance. And if the distance doubles, the field strength halves. This plays into the fact that if you remember, power equals V squared over R. But for the exam, it's just sufficient for us to know that um, the power flux density is proportional to uh, 1 over D squared, and the field strength is proportional to 1 over D. Or another way of saying that is the power flux density is inversely proportional to D squared, and the field strength is inversely proportional to D. So, transmitted field strength. This is the only calculation required in this section, and this formula is given to you on the exam sheet, and you can find it in the syllabus as well. And it says that the field strength in volts per meter is 7 times the root of the ERP, all divided by D, where D is the distance, and E is the effective radiated power. And the blue arrow and the note there says relative to a half-wave dipole. <clears throat> this is quite important um, because um, uh, if you had a gain of an antenna, with and it was um, uh, it given in dBi, then in turning it into the linear gain um, would be incorrect. You'd need to first of all uh, convert it into the gain with respect to a half-wave dipole. And remember the difference there is 2.15 dB with the, um, the gain of a, uh, with respect to a um, uh, isotropic radiator, dBi, being 2.15 more than the gain with respect to a um, half-wave dipole for any given antenna. It's unlikely that they'll give you uh, the gain in anything other than dBd in the exam, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. So, going over that again, the field strength in volts per meter is 7 times the square root of ERP, the effective radiated power. That's a linear power, so if you've given it in dBs, you have to turn it back into a linear power. I'll we'll be doing an example in a minute. Over D, D will be meters the distance away from the antenna. So this is a way of using a formula to see uh, ultimately whether you comply with uh, various environmental standards that have been laid down. It's unnecessary to know these environmental standards just to be able to perform the calculation. So an example here then. We have an antenna with a gain 6 dBd. The power into the antenna is 50 watts and we're 30 meters away. And we wish to calculate the field strength. Now, going back to the antenna gain, 6 dBd, if they'd given you that in um, dBi, that would be 8.15 dBi. So our antenna is 8 dB, 8.15 dB better than the isotropic, but since the uh, dipole is 2.15 better than the isotropic itself, then our uh, antenna in question is 6 dBd. Uh, 6 dB is better than the, the dipole. So, uh, here we have it again, an antenna, 6 dBd, power into the antenna, 50 watts, and we're at 30 meters. So, here's what we have to work out. Uh, 7 times the square root of 4, we, you recall that 6 dB is equivalent to a linear gain of 4 times. And if you were to put that into the calculator, you would put in 4, divided by 10 to get it into bells, uh, second function 10 to the x, and that'll give you approximately 4 times. So it's 7 times root of 4, which is a linear gain, times 50, 50 watts, divided by 30. And if you work out the tau, you'll have 3.3 volts per meter. So you should be able to perform calculations like that. Now, we talked about um, field strength and power flux density um, declining with distance. Um, in the book advance is a graph, which I've reproduced here, showing that decline. 
I'm not quite sure what the value of the graph is in instructional purposes, um, uh, but um, you would expect, uh, given the fact that um, the uh, power flux density declines with um, the square of the distance and the um, uh, field strength declines linearly with the distance, um, that the power flux density would be a curve and the um, uh, field strength would be a straight line, but we've got two curves here which is slightly confusing until you look at the distance scale at the bottom, which is in fact not a linear scale. So I find this graph of, of, of limited use uh, to to explain things. I think I think um, it you know it, it's it's just illustrative of the fact that um, perhaps the, the um, field strength um, declines more slowly, the green line, than the uh, power flux density. I, I can't see how this could be uh, crafted into a question, so I, I, I think this is not of um, not too important. So, mode of transmission with respect to EMC. Now, envelope waveforms are worse than FM type emissions. I think we know that from looking at the um, uh, transmitter interference chapter. Um, the best, uh, and that means the least uh, problematic uh, waveform is FM. Uh, then good data transmissions with constant levels, so we're not seeing huge changes of um, of, uh, of envelope. Then good CW, um, making sure that the waveform is uh, a good shape. It doesn't rise too quickly or decline too quickly. And the worst is SSB with voice. Um, some questions come up there asking you to be able to rank these, so you should be able to rank them um, off pad. So now we're going to look at uh, antenna types, uh, the location and the feed. So <clears throat> with um, electromagnetic uh, uh, compatibility in mind, um, there's a typical shack that we have on the right hand side uh, the station, the, the transceiver, um, the kayaks earth just outside of the uh, building, um, an underground um, kayaks, and um, the kayaks goes vertically up to the antenna or drops vertically from the antenna at right angles. Um, and the antenna should be as high as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Similarly, it should be as far as possible from the house. And of course, it doesn't mean necessarily just your house, but also neighbors' houses as well. And of course, we recognize this is always a compromise. So we should earth the outer coax, and we should uh, bury the uh, coax if possible. If, however, we used a, a, an N-fed antenna, uh, we would expect to have um, strong radiation in the house and here's an example which is probably the best of the worst of, of, of both worlds in as much as the shack is on the um, first floor um, so it's up high so by definition the earth has to have a, a degree of length to get down to the earth so a vertical antenna may be better if it can be uh, further from the house so vertical antennas are normally are more problematic from an RFI point of view than horizontal antennas um, but if it means that it can be further from the house, in this instance, it might be better. We're going to get strong radiation from the end of the antenna. And we're going to get uh, radiation from the RF Earth return back into the house as well. Because effectively, the Earth is going to start to form a part of the antenna system rather than be an Earth. So we're looking at a good way of doing this, a better way of doing this. We need an improved NFED design. And here's one on the screen. Here then, we've got um, uh, a seven megahertz trap at the top, meaning that we've got the strong radiation, at seven megahertz at least, uh, kept away from the building. Um, we, uh, 
keep the down lead from the end of the uh, feeder. The, it, it's um, now remote from the house, but we need to keep it as far away from the um, support pole as possible, particularly if the support pole is conducting. Not so critical, of course, if it's a fiberglass cup pole, which would be the best option. But if it has to be a metal pole, then that separation is important. We need a, a antenna matching unit or terminating unit um, at the end of the garden there. And we need to prevent access to that for safety reasons. So that needs to be uh, some sort of lockable enclosure that it's uh, kept in. And we've earthed our uh, system at three points um, along the route there, making sure that the outer of the coax, which is traveling back from the AMU, um, is um, earthed as, as good as possible. Here's an EMC friendly uh, HF antenna. So here we have a balanced uh, twin feeder going into a ballon. We have a good earth at the bottom. We have a balanced antenna. Uh, the ends of the antenna are a reasonable distance from the house. You can see the egg insulators up there in yellow and a reasonable distance from the uh, support pole. Uh, and the coax is um, uh, buried. Then there's an earth rod at the base of the um, uh, base of the of the vertical part of the feeder, the balanced feeder, um, and earthing the enclosure of the ballon. And an earth rod outside of the um, house itself. So that's an EMC friendly. Uh, antenna and the underground coax is essential um, where you have uh, to run near the objects or the ground. In other words, you couldn't run, continue with a balanced feeder all the way into the house um, because you'd have to go through the wall through a, a big area, um, but also the balanced feeder would be probably too close to the ground. If you look at balanced feeder systems on commercial stations, you can see that the feeders run up on telegraph poles out to the aerial farm um, and so they can remain balanced all the way you know or, or for the horizontal trip to the to the aerial farm but uh, for most people then you know, that's impossible and so at some point we're going to have to transit from balanced to unbalanced and um, then coax is the best bet so um, another point there is to keep the um, uh, end of the antenna as far as possible from the house. And of course, it's a balanced antenna. Let's have a look now at other coupling mechanisms. Um, the uh, mains wiring uh, near a transmitter is a coupling mechanism. The speaker leads and the interconnection leads. If we look at... Um, UHF uh, DVB, that's the digital television signal. Um, uh, and if we'd get RFI with that, um, there's no correlation between the type of interference and the visual or audible effect. Remember that with um, digital television, provided a one is a one and a naught is a naught, the system, indeed all digital systems, will continue to operate. And so a considerable amount of noise can occur before you get a failure. But once a 1 is no longer distinguishable from a, a 0, then at that point the system simply collapses. So that has a rapid onset. Um, these systems also use some error correcting mechanisms, uh, whereby checksums and things are sent up and down. And they buffer the signal within the television. So it may not be that when you key the um, uh, transmitter, you instantly get a picture failure. There may be a few seconds delay before the picture fails. Um, and so you may think, well, it, it's probably nothing to do with me. But in fact, what's happening is that um, the buffer is emptying the um, good quality uh, digital information and rendering a picture and audio. Um, but when the buffer runs out and no further error correction is possible, it'll fail. So here we have no correlation between type of interference and visual or audible effect unlike a, an analog TV, where you may actually hear your voice on the TV. Um, it has a rapid onset, 
and there's a possible delay as the error rate builds up. On the bottom there, you see the um, uh, block diagram of how it all works. DB tuner, which is selecting the RF, um, analog to digital conversion and error correction, and processing into sound, video, and data, which then goes into the uh, screen, the speakers, etc. Let's have a look now at pickup. So, pickup then, it can be by three mechanisms. The first one is direct pickup, and that can be blast through, which isn't frequency dependent. That simply blasts directly into the circuitry of the interfered equipment. Uh, it can be image channel pickup, as possible, if you have a superheterodyne FM receiver, and um, you may not be interfering on the actual frequency, but you may be interfering on the image frequency, that's possible. Uh, you may be transmitting straight through into the IF. I gave an example earlier on. Is the IF 10.7 megahertz? Are you transmitting on uh, the 10 megahertz band? And in which case, the filtering of that IF may not be uh, able to um, adequately screen your much stronger 10.7, uh, your 10 megahertz signal from the 10 meg uh, 10.7 megahertz signal and that may cause problems. Um, direct pickup will happen even with the TV antenna disconnected, and it's more problematic on VHF and UHF than HF. Conducted pickup ha happens through leads, and the solution to this is to fit uh, ferrites. So here we're talking about speaker leads, um, SCART leads between um, uh, video recorders or uh, video players and televisions, um, but also phono leads connecting audio or video between items of equipment. So that's conducted, it's picked up by the interconnecting leads, and the solution there is to um, fit ferrites. An aerial pickup, that's on the down lead or the braid, and the fright will help if signal is on the braid, but not if it's picked up by the antenna. Let's have a look at overloading, intermodulation, cross-modulation and blocking. Here we've got a um, masthead amplifier or a TV distribution amplifier, much the same thing, maybe located in the loft. And we have a very strong amateur signal there in red and a wanted TV signal in green. And the block diagram of the TV distribution amplifier generously shows a bandpass filter and an amplifier. But particularly with some of the older ones, um, you can almost eliminate the bandpass filter and just sketch in a wideband amplifier um, because they were not very selective. Modern ones are much better. Um, so the purpose of this then is to boost the signal from the aerial so that it can be distributed around the house to a number of televisions and possibly also it might be wideband enough to pick up FM radio. Now a modern one will do this with a separate filter chain but the old ones were simply just wideband enough to cope with uh, uh, FM radio. So looking at that then the broadband may include FM radio and these are particularly prone to interference and the cause of a lot of problems. Um, the amateur signal may not be filtered, particularly, as I say, in old ones. And so the uh, antenna amplifier there, or the distribution amplifier, may be um, happily um, amplifying your very high, already high signal, as well as the wanted signal. And this may cause the amplifier to overload. You can imagine how this would happen if we've looked at the circuit's uh, biasing issues in bipolar transistors where um, the signal swings from uh, the low point to the high point. Uh, if the signal swings too much, then um, the negative half cycles, for example, uh, may cause a cutoff, um, or the positive half cycles may cause it to go into saturation. So if the amplifier goes into overload, then it starts to distort. And of course, it won't only distort for the um, overloading signal, it'll then distort for all signals. 
So the distortion will lead to harmonics or intermodulation products. Harmonics or uh, or intermodulation products because of, of the mixing. Equally, that, that same block diagram could apply to a, a radio receiver. So in a way you can think of this as a, um, a masthead amplifier, distribution amplifier, or radio receiver, all suffering from the same problems. Cross-modulation then, mentioned in the syllabus, if the interfering signal is so large that it causes the amplifier or stage gain to change, then the interfering signal's modulation will be imprinted on the wanted, wanted signal. So if you have a large SSB signal as the amateur signal, it'll be going in there and it'll be um, pulsing, if you like, or uh, modulating the uh, amplifier completely out of its normal linear ranges in sympathy with your SSB uh, voice envelope. Um, and this will also then imprint on the wanted signal, if the wanted signal, for example, was FM radio, that will start to be uh, modulated uh, in, a co in an amplitude way, when, when it shouldn't because it's FM, um, in accordance with your um, uh, voice signal. SSB is the worst for this, although AM and CW can cause problems. Let's move on to blocking. Blocking, if you uh, see a strong signal coming in uh, from an amateur signal, that will be uh, detected and the AGC circuits will turn down the gain. So the wanted signal does not get amplified as it should do and is blocked. Um, with an analog TV signal, it becomes weak and snowing occurs. SSB signal may cause blocking in time with the signal modulation. And here you can see then that is the, um, in red, the, um, you should remember this from the chapter on receivers, that is the AGC line going back and altering the gain of the IF amplifier. So the story here is that the strong amateur signal has come through the detector. The detector has uh, given uh, detected a signal, um, turned it into DC, and fed it back to the IF amplifiers and said, turn down the, the level, it's too high. Unfortunately, the wanted signal then um, is also turned down as well uh, and isn't amplified. Let's have a look at intermodulation products. Um, these occur when you get a non-linear effect and they rely on unwanted mixing. So you should look at the advanced chapter on transmitter interference, uh, which gives you plenty of information about uh, intermodulation products. So the primary cure is filtering, but if this is impractical because of the proximity of two signals, an attenuator may help. So if your signal is close to the, the, wanted, the uh, wanted and the unwanted signals are close and filtering is not easily achievable, then you might like to try putting in an attenuator. The attenuator, of course, will reduce both the wanted and the unwanted signal, but will reduce the third order in the modulate, IMPs, into, into modulation products, by more than the attenuation. And an um, explanation of that is given in, the, um, in Chapter 12, EMC of Advance. So it's only practical if the wanted signal is strong enough. If you put an attenuator in, you reduce the level of both the wanted and the unwanted. And um, hey presto, you've uh, reduced the uh, intermodulation products, which is a good thing. But you may have also reduced the wanted signal by too much. So this is um, a, a sort of a, a, a fine balance to achieve, uh, but it may, may work. So this is where you're going to get uh, in, in, um, intermodulation products. If the um, distortion doesn't happen actually in the masthead amplifier or the distribution amplifier, but the extra gain provided that may overload the front end of a subsequent receiver. So what we've shown here then is a distribution amplifier and um, it could have a gain 
much as say 26 dB, which is a lot. Uh, and it could be um, uh, 26 dB, uh, you can work that out in your head, 20 being 100, 6 being 4, so that's 400 times. So um, the amateur signal can be coming in, the wanted signal should be coming in, um, and both are, uh, in this example, um, amplified, uh, the amateur signal perhaps by less, but the wanted signal by 26 dB, um, and they're passed through to an FM radio through the, through the distribution amplifier system. Now, um, let's assume for the sake of argument that the um, distribution amplifier is not overloaded in itself, uh, and it passes clean copies of the amateur and the wanted signal through. But because the levels are now so high, they're 26 dB up for the wanted signal, and by a lesser amount up for the amateur signal, um, in the front end of the FM radio, then the distortion may occur, all of the um, stuff that we've talk and have talked about before, may occur in the subsequent um, uh, radio. Um, so that's something to, to watch out for. So here's a picture of a ferrite ring mains choke. So we're having a look at some methods of filtering here. And this is how to wind it. And um, the uh, point there is that the um, ferrite should be as close as possible to the back of the equipment on the mains lead. Um, the wire should be round round, um, but only using about two thirds of the, the circle of the um, uh, ferrite ring to uh, avoid capacitive coupling between the input and the output of it. Um, what we're doing here is providing inductance. If we provide uh, capacitance, then that uh, negates the inductance um, and um, stops what we're trying to do. So a ferrite ring uh, choke on a coax feeder is, is much the same. And here's an example of one uh, wound onto a, um, on, onto a ferrite ring. And this is showing the uh, direction of the common mode currents. Let's move on to filters. Um, a homemade notch filter is shown in the book Advance. The left-hand diagram is the meant to be the physical depiction of it with um, coaxial uh, sockets on the left and right of the uh, metal box that it's uh, placed into, a homemade inductor and a capacitor then down to earth and on the right hand side you see the uh, electrical circuit of it if you like and this is a series tuned circuit to earth so that <clears throat> at, resonant, at its resonant frequency, when Xc equals uh, Xl, uh, that um, inductor and capacitor combination will be low impedance. So at one particular frequency, it will have a uh, low impedance, and that's then a notch filter. So you can see the signal coming in on the left uh, will not be attenuated for most frequencies, but for the frequency that the series tuned circuit is tuned to, um, it will be attenuated to earth. Let's have a look at some RC filters. Here's a high pass filter. Um, and uh, we label it V in and V out. Then uh, it'll have a um, response something like that. So we can label that, that uh, V out will be nearly as much as V in for, for uh, most frequencies um, that are past the higher frequencies, but at the lower end of the frequencies, um, you'll get some attenuation. And when V in um, is uh, 0 0.707, when V out rather is 0 0.707 of V in, um, then we call that the corner or the cutoff frequency. And if we look at a low-pass filter, similar sort of thing. This time the capacitor is going to earth, 
So if we look at its response, it's passing the low frequencies but attenuating the higher frequencies. And at the lower frequencies, uh, V out equals V in, or nearly, and <clears throat> at 0.707 of uh, V in, when V out is 0.707 of V in, you've got the uh, corner or the cutoff frequency. Now the way to interpret these is to think about what happens at DC and then a very high frequency. If you look at the top one, um, if you imagine that V in was DC, then it's simply blocked by the capacitor. And so that gives you, if you like, one cross on the graph on the right, right down there at the origin, because there would be no V out, because it would be blocked by the capacitor. Uh, and then if you look at a very, very high frequency, then essentially at a high frequency, the reactance of the capacitor could become zero. So you could simply draw a line instead of the capacitor, just short circuit that capacitor. Then V out equals V in. Um, and you can then draw uh, another point at a high frequency. So that gives you two points on your graph. Um, and then it's just a question of um, drawing in the curve for the transition. Similarly, on the uh, low pass filter at the bottom, um, if we look at it at DC, then the capacitor is essentially open circuit, and so V in will transfer pretty much to V out, so that gives you a mark on the graph. And at a very, very high frequency, V out is a short circuit, so that will give you another mark on the graph, down with a high frequency, with no V out, because v, uh, the capacitor is short circuit, and then you can simply just draw in the transition, the curve, of the transition between DC and a very high frequency. So that is a, a quick way, if you like, of figuring these things out. Looking at uh, LC bandpass filters, a couple of examples given in advance. Uh, here we have a series tuned circuit uh, in series with the filter and a parallel tuned circuit uh, in parallel, if you like, with the filter. So achieving the same result as a LC low pass filter, uh, but just different uh, way of doing the same thing. Let's look at uh, band stop filters. Here we have a, a series tuned circuit across the um, uh, across the two lines of the filter at the top, and so at one particular frequency that becomes essentially short circuit because remember when X C equals uh, X L, <coughs> Z equals naught. So the impedance of that circuit at a specific frequency. The resonant frequency of uh, the L and C there will be zero. But for all other frequencies, uh, DC, again, if you look at it uh, from, from DC, the capacitor will block it. And if you look at it at a really, really high frequency, then the inductor will have very high Z, and that will uh, block it. So the signal will go through. So it's only at one point that the signal doesn't go through, and that's when uh, XL equals XC. And you can apply the same sort of logic to the lower circuit. There's a parallel tuned circuit, um, if you like, in series with the filter. So looking at the filter, V in and V out, um, if you like, then um, at one particular frequency, that top line will be high impedance. At DC, it'll be very low impedance because the inductor is a short circuit, if you like, at uh, DC. And at a really, really uh, high frequency, it will also be short circuit because then the capacitor is short circuit at a high frequency. So um, looking at the lower circuit, there's just one point when it becomes high impedance. And that's represented by the graph on the right. And one thing to notice is that it's got some passband loss. That's the term that they've introduced there. But um, no matter what um, uh, frequency you're talking about, you'll get some losses just because of the introduction of the... Uh, of the um, of the of the filter. Here's some high and low pass cascaded filters, or so-called PI filters, also spelled PI, because of the shape. So looking at the top one there, um, the response is given on the right. Um, it's going to be um, fairly flat at DC because. Um, at the lower frequencies because the inductor 
will not uh, really uh, kick in. But when the inductor does kick in, um, you're going to start getting some um, uh, attenuation there happening. Uh, and similarly, the opposite will happen. At DC, for the, for the other one, uh, the capacitor will initially be uh, open circuit, um, and so not much getting through, but that will rise fairly quickly with frequency, um, and um, you'll get those responses. Now you need to be able to recognize those responses for pi filters. A pass band, and then the stop band for the top one, the stop band, and the pass band for the other. And you'll find those in the book advance. So here's an example of two bandpass filters. Um, these are slightly more complex filters, and sort of working through the logic of them uh, isn't quite as easy. But um, here we've got combination of um, uh, parallel tuned circuits and series tuned circuits, um, and um, that's producing the response that you see on the right. Now it's the same response, but um, out of band, um, the top one is uh, low impedance and the um, uh, bottom one is high impedance, out of band. Um, you can figure that out because um, the uh, impedance of the series tuned circuit, the single series tuned circuit, will be uh, a high impedance out of band on the top one. And here, the title's wrong on this slide, it should say uh, uh, mains filter uh, or filter suppressor. And here is a diagram of a filter suppressor with a voltage dependent resistor across the live and the neutral. But the note in advance says that some filter suppressors will have three voltage dependent resistors between live and neutral, live and earth, and neutral and earth. And this is providing <coughs> a transformer wire in series with the live and uh, in series with the neutral uh, going out to the equipment with suppressive capacitors and the suppressive uh, inductor in the middle. Uh, and you probably um, need to have a look at that uh, description of its operation in advance. I won't go into it now, but it's um, probably something that you do need to uh, have a little look at. You certainly do need to be able to recognize this circuit and say, yes, that is the main suppressor. Um, a ferrite choke and how it behaves electrically. electrically. Here again, we reiterate the fact that we should only use about two thirds of the ring so that we don't have capacitive uh, coupling between the output and the input. And here we have the ex explanation there at the bottom. And again, this is, um, uh, it goes into it in more detail. But basically, we've got the unwanted in-phase currents are blocked by the choke, and the wanted anti-phase currents are not. Um, so that's how it's behaving electrically to prevent um, uh, the uh, unwanted in-phase currents. So, in other words, radiation on, for example, the um, uh, braid. So it's a, this is a recommended way of breaking the braid. It doesn't physically break it, but um, it, um, if, if it does, it does it electrically. electrically. Um, it is worth noting that there are different grades or different mixes of ferrite. Um, if you like, if you can think of ferrite as small iron filings and a sort of resin, and the grade and length of the iron fi filings uh, will determine the response of the ferrite in terms of different frequencies. So for different frequencies, you would get different grades or different mixes of ferrites. Um, the inductance on a filter such as this increases as the square of the number of turns. Um, but again, you, you can't simply just keep putting turns on until you use the whole ferrite up. You need to keep the um, input and output uh, separately. Um, if uh, ferrites are not convenient, rods can be used, but they're not as effective because they don't provide the same degree of coupling. Clip-on ferrites, which I think we've all seen on mains leads, were available, where the plug prevents threading through a ring. So if you have a moulded 
uh, plug already on a piece of equipment, you've got two choices. One is to uh, cut the plug off and um, thread it through a ferrite and then put the plug back, uh, you know, put a, a plug back on, or you can perhaps use clip-on ferrites. Um, they won't be as effective because they don't provide the same degree of uh, um, coupling, but um, but they may help. So how uh, can we make a home constructive high part brass filter and braid breaker? Well, here here is one. It physically breaks the braid. Um, in as much as the output braid there you can see uh, goes through a capacitor at the bottom. Um, uh, the values are given in the um, book advance, but I don't think we'd be expected to remember them. If you're interested, uh, refer to the book. Um, but um, L1 and L2 are four turns of 20 SWG wire, um, and the dimensions are given there. Um, now, braid breakers, you can buy them also uh, from uh, commercial outlets, um, and uh, they use much the same circuitry as you've got here. Um, some people say they work really well, others say that they have been caused to, uh, found to cause problems with TV, text, and digital. So here is, if you like, the, the last resort. If you find that you've got pickup in audio stages or non-RF stages uh, where it's causing a problem, then putting a uh, one nanofarad capacitor or something of that order between the base and the emitter is one way of filtering it. Another way of filtering it is on the base there to uh, thread an inductor around it. So we're doing this afterwards rather than have an inductor in the circuit, but we're putting this on uh, retrospectively, so you can put a, an inductor uh, piece of ferrite around the base that will hopefully attenuate the higher frequency RF signals which may be breaking through into the audio amplifier while allowing the audio to go through. Um, here the uh, an inductor has been uh, put in series with the base um, uh, and we've cut the track from the base to its next component and soldered in between the two ends of cut track a, a ferrite um, or an inductor rather and here's a combination of the two we've got both the um, uh, inductor in series with the or, or, or a piece of wire with a ferrite round it it doesn't really matter the same thing in series with the uh, base of this transmitter of this transistor uh, and we've also got a base emitter uh, capacitor so one mana farad to try and decouple the RF. So finally, we move on to EMC in vehicles. So these bullet points, EMC in vehicles can have serious safety implications. Um, if you have a two meter trans, uh, transmitter and you key it, and all the warning lights come on from the en engine management system, etc. Remember that um, the vehicles, other devices are like uh, the ABS are computer controlled um, and, and it may even affect the, the airbag. So it, it's a serious business if it goes wrong. Uh, RF can affect vehicle electronic circuits, including engine management systems, um, particularly if you're using a transmitter of greater than 10 watts. RF and power leads must be kept separate and not parallel to vehicle wiring. Manufacturer's recommendations of maximum RF and antenna location must be complied with. Radio equipment should not use accessory sockets. Radio equipment should have separate wiring to vehicle battery to prevent RF entering the wiring loom. DC negative must be earthed to vehicle body as close as possible to the battery body to provide a low impedance path for any stray RF. Refer to the manufacturer's handbook for advice on EMC. Conduct stationary tests before road tests. I think this would be a fairly uh, good common sense point. And detailed advice is contained in the Federation of Communication Services Code of Practice, uh, FCS 1362. So those are items you should be familiar with for the exam to do with uh, EMC in, um, uh, in vehicles. So that pretty well sums up uh, EMC. As I said, it accounts for eight questions, so it's a fairly significant topic. And together with transmitter interference, uh, it accounts for a few more questions than that. 
So it's definitely um, worth reading in conjunction with uh, transmitter interference and uh, trying to get as many of these points uh, on board as possible. You should be able to rec uh, recognize filter responses um, and you can apply the uh, DC and really high frequency tests, the simpler ones. Uh, where filters become cascaded, it's more complex to do that and you just need to memorize the, the basic shapes and, and be able to draw the basic responses. So there we have it. Uh, good luck with your studies and indeed good luck with the exam. Uh, thank you once again and we look forward to uh, welcoming you back in the next video.